And turn in your Bibles to Titus chapter 2 tonight. Titus Titus 2. And um, let's look at verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify him to himself, a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And um, let's, um, let's go to chapter 3, verse 3. It says, For we also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived. And boy, you got to remember that, you know. It's, 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 uh, it's really easy when you've been saved for a while, saved for years, and, um, and you know, you can, you can really develop some high expectations for people. Um, you can really um, have this idea that somehow, you know, it's like the, the rich man and the publican, you know, Lord, I, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes at all that I possessed. You know, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. And, um, you know, um, one of the things he says here, he says to remember. Now, if you got saved young, uh, praise the Lord for that. The Lord rescued you from great disaster, and uh, he kept you from a ton of things uh, that, you, that you could have been involved in. You know, you need to remember as you, uh, you know, go down through the streets. And, you know, we do. We, we uh, even a, a day or two ago, you know, we got talking about the homeless people. And we would agree that that, home, that whole situation in this city is a total gong show, shamas. It shouldn't be the way it is. And we would all agree with that. We, we all understand that. Um, and yet, at the same time, you know, um, it's, it's been said that, you know, you, you encounter the odd homeless person down there, and uh, you'll come across one that used to be a doctor. He, he never thought he'd be on the street. You know, you, you and I, we walk by those people and they're, and they're just wasted. And they're, you know, they get that scraggly beard and, and they're matted hair and they're rooting through the garbage cans and they're looking for food and you wouldn't dream of living like that. And you know why, you know why you're not there? It's because of the goodness of Almighty God. And He has kept you, and He's preserved you, and He's blessed you, and you didn't deserve it. You're, you're no better in, on, the, on the playing field of sin. You're just as much of a sinner as they are. You know, it just, you know, it just, life played out different for them. You know, they made some bad decisions. You ever made any? Wow. Uh, But you know what? By the grace of God, we're still here. You know, when you when you walk down through there, young people, when you walk down through there. Just remember. Let's let's hope you never wind up there. But just remember that that could have been your dad, your mom. You know, for nine months, we got in the prison in Prince Albert and it was a, a, a maximum security facility. And um uh, they actually had the whole spectrum, but there was, there was, it was a large correctional facility. And uh, a guy in our church uh, had, had also been in and out of there. And he said to me one day, he said, you know, he said a few years back I was in there and he said, I saw a lawyer that I knew. You know, he was rolling in the big bucks, but somebody nailed him for something illegal and there he was with all the rest of the, the people at the bottom of the barrel. And there he was. The Lord said, don't ever forget. We also were sometimes disobedient. Foolish living in divers' lusts. He said, don't forget. Verse 3. Living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another, but after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. 
He saved us. You know, there's an interesting word <coughs> that shows up. And so I'm going to just sort of use it as a launching pad tonight. <coughs> uh, it's the word appear. Look at verse 11 <coughs> of chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared. Look at verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing. And look at chapter 3, verse 4. But after that the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man, appeared. Wow, it's interesting. Just some amazing things show up there. Some things appeared. And we're going to talk about that tonight. Lord, thank you. It's wonderful to be here. And um, God, we are in a wonderful place. We are, we are riding on the high places of the earth. We are forgiven. We are blessed. And Lord, we have a glorious future. And um, uh, Lord, we'll get together. We'll enjoy you tonight. And uh, we won't feel bad about it in the morning. Uh, Lord, it's just wonderful to be here. We have, a, we have a friendship and a kinship that goes way deeper than even uh, our blood family. And God, we thank you for all of that. Now, Lord, help us. And we pray, God, that you would please, Lord, let your word, let it live tonight in our hearts. May we walk away, Lord, knowing that um, you have visited with us tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. To appear, to appear. The word means to suddenly be in view. You know, um, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing. You know, one day, we, we whom having not seen, we love, we love the Lord. We believe everything about him. We see his evidence everywhere. We see it in our calendar. We, see, we just see it all over the place. And, um, but one day, he will actually appear. To our, to our eyes. He will, be, he will suddenly be in view. He will become visible. He will become obvious. I want you to see the first, first mention of the word appear, and that's in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1, verse 9, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. You know, the earth was covered with, with water. And all of a sudden, the Lord said, okay. You know, he does everything just at his word. And he said, let the dry land appear. And man, suddenly, what had always been there, but nobody could see it. Now it, it suddenly became visible. Look at Second Chronicles chapter 1. Second, Second Chronicles. Chronicles 1, verse 7. 2 Chronicles 1, 7, In that night did God appear unto Solomon and said unto him, Ask what I shall give thee. And this particular, um, this use of the word appear shows up over and over and over and over and over again in the Old Testament where the Lord appeared, an angel appeared. Uh, you know, um, the Lord suddenly in one way or another, uh, he let some semblance of his presence I suddenly it became visible. Um, I want to talk to you tonight about things that appear and disappear. Things that appear and disappear. You know, there's, um, there's some things that disappear. You know, in the Bible, there were some people that disappeared. One of the first ones that ever disappeared was Enoch. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. You know, Enoch was just walking one day, and and, uh, and, you know, to anybody that was standing around, he just, he just vanished. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. For, for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And Enoch was taken out before the flood, before judgment came. And he's really a picture of us that will be raptured. You know, one day, you know, you're just walking down the road and, and the next thing you know, you hear that trumpet sound and we will be, we will vanish um, we have been delivered from the wrath to come. And uh, one day there'll be a whole bunch of people uh, that will just literally just disappear. Elijah disappeared. You know, um, Elijah and Elisha were walking together and somehow even the sons of the prophets knew that on that day, Elijah would be taken up to heaven and they, they didn't really understand it, but they knew it was going to happen. And um, Elisha, 
uh, stayed with Elijah. And uh, finally he said, you know, Enoch, uh, excuse me, Elijah said, uh, what do you want before I go? And he said, I would like a double portion of thy spirit. And Elijah said, thou hast ask, thou hast ask a hard thing. But if you see me, when I go up, it shall be done unto thee. And just a few minutes later, uh, man, the horses and chariots of fire came through and, um, and Elisha could see it. And he said, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he went up and as he went up, his, his cloak fell. And of course, you guys know the story. Elisha really did have that double portion. But, you know, the sons of the prophets, it said, were watching in the distance. And you know what they saw? They just saw Elijah disappear. Look at Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. God knows how to make people disappear. In Acts 8, Philip has, um, you know, witnessed to the Ethiopian eunuch. And um, he has gotten saved and baptized. And uh, you come to the end of the chapter. In verse 39, Acts 8, 39. And when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Boy, one minute Philip was, was uh, there with the eunuch and, and uh, man, the, it was just a wonderful thing. But the next thing the eunuch knew, Philip disappeared, but the, the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. You know, sometimes in the Bible, people disappear. Sometimes in the Bible, churches disappear. We mentioned that this morning, how the churches of Revelation 2 and 3, those churches in those locations, no longer exist. Um, they disappeared. Brother Hemia one day was talking and, and he just made a statement and I've never forgotten it. He said, it's amazing how the Lord set up the church. You know, here we are and the church is the people. You know, um, it's, it's wonderful to have a building. Thank God we have a place to meet. And, uh, you know, we, you know, I was thinking about it today again uh, with all the crew downstairs. I was thinking, man, what a wonderful day it will be to have a building of our own. And, um, and then Mrs. Matheson was coming up the stairs and she was uh, talking about, how it was so hot and it was just, it was a job coming up those stairs. And I thought, and I, I just instantly, I thought, what a blessing it will be to have a place of our own, have it on ground level and, and all that sort of thing. But you know what, what, what really drives all that is, is not a few people that just want their own building. It's, it's, it's all of us and we are what the church is. And uh, Hemia said to me one day, he said, it's really something how God set up the church to where, you know, there it is and it's alive and it thrives and it grows, but overnight it can disappear. I thought about that. I don't know, five or six years ago, my daughter Elizabeth, before she was married, she, uh, she went on a mission trip. Many of you remember Brother Logan. He preached for us on a couple occasions and um, um, Brother Logan had been a missionary in Romania. Uh, and then one of his next places that he went was Thessaloniki. That's the Bible, Thessalonica. Um, two or three guys really got a burden for Thessaloniki because there was that place so prominent in early Christianity. I mean, one of the letters that we read 2,000 years later was written to that church. But there were a few guys that went over there, some preachers, and they were touring that area, and, and they, they, they got burdened because here was this place where the Apostle Paul had been. And you know what's there today as far as a Bible-believing, preaching church? Now, there is one today, but that's because Brother Logan and his crew spent a year there. But before that, there was nothing. They couldn't find anything. The Orthodox Church has a stronghold. It is the church of Thessaloniki. And he said they tried to find Christians. They tried to find at least one church that preached the truth, and they couldn't find one. And they thought, what a terrible thing. And so they began to pray and seek the Lord and put together a project. And so for uh, a year, 
Uh, Brother Logan stayed there, but week after week after week after week after week, they had different church groups coming in, and they were going out the street, and they were passing out tracts and, and preaching on the street and trying to win people to the Lord and witnessing to everything that moved, and, and um, it took about a year. And they had a little core group of people again. But it's interesting, you know, that church that had been there two centuries ago, it had vanished. It had been an amazing church. You know, I've watched churches in my lifetime. Is there a church we went to when I was about um, um, 15 years old? And uh, we had a lot of churches in our area. It was, you know, that area was considered part of the Bible Belt, you know, so there were Baptist churches everywhere. But this one church really impressed my dad. Number one, they had a Christian school. The Christian school movement was really new then, like really new. And, um, and the independent Baptists were the ones running those schools back then. They were the only ones doing it back then. And um, it was a church, it was a, it was a school that had just, just come into being a year or two before. I was stepping into 10th grade. Uh, dad was really going to put my sister in there. She was stepping into 7th grade and my sister was really impressionable, and she was already starting to lean the wrong direction in the public school. So my dad thought, you know what? The best thing we can do is get her in that school. And um, and my sister, we were outside playing, and she was she was griping about it. You know, she's like, well, you know, I have to leave all my friends at my little country school, and you know, and all this. And I looked at my sister, and I was telling the truth. I said, Susan, I said, if I could go there, I would. She said, you would? I said, of course. I wasn't allowed to go to the dances. I wasn't allowed to participate in all sorts of things. Um, you know, and I was getting heat over it. And I saw the Christian school as a chance to, man, I could, I could escape all that. So long story short, we visited that church and dad put us in there. But one of the things that impressed my dad about that church, that church ran about 300 people. And it was, um, it was, uh, it was shaped in a horseshoe. And uh, you could see a lot of the young people off on the, I'm sitting at the back, and you could look off to the right-hand wing of the auditorium, and there was like, I don't know, 15 or 20 young people sitting there, and a lot of the young people sat with their parents. That impressed my dad. It seemed like they had the same crowd Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. That impressed my dad. And then he saw these young people, and he said, man, these young people, they're listening. They're, uh, they're like... They're not all sitting there passing notes because we had been to some of those kind of churches and they're paying attention. And it was just like, wow, this is a good thing. So we joined that church and, and we were there for a few years and, and uh, eventually that pastor resigned and um, actually not long after that. And then his, his son took it for a little while. That was a good thing. His son was actually more conservative than he was. And, um, and then the church started to drift. About 10 years later or so, you know, that church was, uh, they were having dances in the gymnasium. And that church, as I knew it, ceased to exist. There was a, a very large Bible-believing church in Rochester, New York. Um, some of you might be familiar with it, but back in that day, it was one of the hubs of the King James movement in the North. And uh, again, it was, a, it was a big church and man, great things were happening there. And, um, and all of a sudden the church changed hands a couple times and that church no longer exists. I came to Edmonton and uh, the contractor that I worked for, um, he, we were driving through town one day. He, he lived and did most of his work up on the North end of the city and some on the West, and we drove by a certain location. He said, you see that building right there? He said, that's where I used to go to church. And the church was no longer a Baptist church. Um, the, the church that had been there that he remembered, where he got saved, that it had such an impact on his life, it no longer existed. You know, our churches appear, and they disappear. In Luke 18, it says, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith 
on the earth. You know, another thing that, that appears and disappears is, is faith. And it says that at the end, it doesn't say there won't be any, but the Lord does ask the question, you know, will, will it be there when I come back? And of course, this doesn't have to be. Romans 10, 17 says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the disciples said, Lord, increase our faith. So, I mean, you've got the word of God that's the builder of your faith and you can talk to the Lord about your faith. But faith is all about the unseen. Look at 2 Corinthians 4 for a moment. 2 Corinthians 4. You know, everything, good thing you've got as a believer, um, it is a gift from the Lord and it, it's, it's uh, rooted in a spiritual thing. You know, if you're saved and you've got a good marriage, um, you know, that's a physical thing, and yet it's rooted in the Lord. Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. So as you drift from the Lord, you begin to undermine the foundation of that great thing that God gave you. And every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variable to see a shadow of turning. Every good thing you have, you say, man, I got some good stuff. I do too. You know what you ought to do? You ought to raise your hands to heaven and praise His name. Just because you got it today don't mean it'll always be there. You can look around. You can see how the kindness of God has appeared in your life. Make sure you don't do something to make it disappear. Because God's made a lot of things disappear. A lot of his stuff, he's made it disappear. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, that, that ought to be our trademark. You know, we see things, but we really ought to be looking at the things you can't see. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. They're just, they're just going to be here for a little while. Boy, I remember my dad. You guys heard all my stories about my dad, how I love my dad, how he affected me for Jesus Christ. But I woke up one morning and he was gone. Now I'm going to see him again, praise the Lord. But wow, he disappeared. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Look at verse 17. For our light affliction, you know, that little bit of trouble you got in your world that we all think is so great. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. How, how can you really accept that? Only by faith. Only by faith. You believe that your light affliction is working something for you on the other side. Well, how, how do you know that? You don't see that, but you believe that by faith. Look at verse 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish. That's the person you see in the mirror. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man, that's a part of you you really don't see with your eyes. Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. You know, folks get consumed with this world. It's so easy to do. I mean, we live in this world. We got a job to do. We got, you know, and God is good. God understands that we live in a material world. He gave it to us. He gave us all things richly to enjoy. And uh, man, praise his name. You know, you walk out. I think it blesses him when you walk out and you see a beautiful day. Yesterday we had a beautiful day. I'm sure several of you during the day. You just took a brief moment and you just said, thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day. And I think that blesses the Lord's heart because we live in a world that they don't do that. They don't recognize anything is from him. And when his people look up and they say, well, Lord, you sure did a good job today. This is beautiful. Thank you, Lord. I think that blesses him. But we get consumed with what we see. And that's, the, that's really sometimes the, the opponent of your faith. It's called the lust of the eyes. It's, it's what they see here and now. 
And you got to be careful because that world you see is always competing with that other world. And you got to watch, you know, uh, boy, the death of a lot of Christianity is what's going on with your eyes. You know, the shows you, you see, the movies you watch, the virtual reality, the advertisements, the things, the fads, places to go and people to see. See. You know, if God's given you great faith uh, and, and your faith can grow, again, the disciples said, Lord, increase our faith. Um, if he's given you faith and if it's growing, praise his name. Um, but you, you need to keep nurturing that. You need to keep your finger on the pulse of that thing. And make sure nothing's undermining that. Because it can disappear. Look at Amos chapter 8. Amos. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos. Amos 8, verse 11. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. Look at the time frame of this passage. Look at verse 9. Verse 9. And it shall come to pass... In that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. Now, those of you that know your Bibles, you know when that happens. That's at the end. Okay? Um, look at chapter 9, verse 8. Chapter 9, verse 8. Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from off the face of the earth, saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, saith the Lord. For lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations, like as corn is sifted in a sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say, the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us." In that day, now there again, what you're looking at here, you're seeing a, a time frame, okay? So, you know, the first verse we looked at showed the time of the end, and, and you're going to see that again here. In that day, will I raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the heathen, which are called by my name, saith the Lord God that doeth this. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed, and the mountains shall drop sweet wine and all the hills shall melt. And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land a watch. And they shall no more be pulled up out of their land which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. Now you can tell as you're reading here, the whole context of this is the end. And again, it just revisits some things we, we've talked about often in the last year. But he says one of the things that happens at the end is it gets to the place where it's hard to find the words of the Lord. And, of course, this is a reference to the Word of God itself. You know, um, you know you've got the proliferation of Bible versions, you know, and, and uh, man, a, a lot of people, they, would, uh, they, really, they really don't know where to look. If they wanted to find that, in fact, they don't even believe a perfect word of God exists. But this is also a reference to a message from the Lord. You know what the spirit saith unto the churches. It's talking about these folks in this time period. It will reach a point where they will be looking for men and women with a real connection with the Lord that are truly vessels 
that have some sort of a real message from the Lord. Anybody can just quote texts and anybody can, you know, uh, as it has been said, they can traffic in unfelt truth. But there's going to come a time when people are looking for somebody that really has a message from the Lord. We sing that song, Channels Only, Blessed Master. And they're going to be looking for those kind of people. The Bible says the day will come when people will hunt for preachers and evangelists with God's message, not their message, God's message. You know, after a while, you know, there, there are some people with discernment out there and they're looking and truth has a sound to it. And, um, and, and they're looking and they're listening and they're going, no, that's not it. No, that's not it. No, that's not it. And they're looking for a message from the Lord. You know, um, one of the things that's happening as we move towards the end is, um, man, there were a lot of guys that were um, real tremendous preachers in the last 40 years. And I'm talking about my circles. You probably know some in uh, maybe perhaps other circles, but there were some really great guys. My kids have heard me talk about people. And um, uh, when my kids were small, they actually got to hear a few of these guys, but they were pretty small. And so thank the Lord. You know, some of these guys, there's still some clips on, you know, YouTube and all that. You can you can still get a hold of some of that. But you know what's happened with a lot of those guys? They're dying off. Like gobs of them are dying off. You know, there comes a day at the end where people are looking. And you know what's happening is... Those voices that used to be everywhere, they disappear. Um, you know what? You know, we're going to have our special meetings. We're going to have Brother Gip. We're going to have, we're gonna have uh, you know, the Nova Scotia guys and all that. And I was reminded out there at the meeting um, in, um, in Montreal uh, what a blessing it was. And I remember thinking to myself, this, this, this is the kind of meetings that I remember. You know, and I was, I was just thankful that some of these things still exist. They still exist. But boy, it's a strange thing that I'm thinking that way. That tells you where it's going. You know, thank God, every good meeting, every time God deals with your heart and that fire's burning your heart and you feel like raising your hands during the song service, Praise him. Thank him that it hasn't disappeared. Here's another thing that disappears. 1 Samuel 28. Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. For the night cometh. You know what? I think some people, they think, you know, well, you know, I, I, you know, I, got, I got life to live and I got some things I want to do. And, and um and, you know, a little later on down the road, I'm going to get serious about all this. And um, I think the people that think that way, I think some of them are very sincere. But the problem is um, you don't ever want to do that and, and someday arrive at this place where um, you, you're ready, but everything's changed and those opportunities aren't there anymore. And it's not the same as it once was. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Man, if you're going to get right with God, do it now. Are you going to witness? Do it now. Are you going to up your game? Do it now. 1 Samuel 28, verse 6. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. And he went, and two men with him, 
And they came to the woman by night, and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? You know what disappears in some people's lives? And often this happens with time and the longer they live is convictions. Convictions. You know what Saul had done? Saul had really made some blunders and some mistakes from about the, the two-year point of his kingship on. But, um, but one of the, the right things that Saul had done was he had carried out the law of Moses where it says, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. And man, he had absolutely, we talk about going on a witch hunt. And there must have been something of that that had occurred under Saul because she says, now she's a witch, and, uh, and she, they, they only knew of one in the land, they only, but they knew where she lived. And, uh, and, and she said, well, you know what Saul has done? She said, Saul's chased them all out of the land or, or exterminated them. You know, there was a day when Saul would not have even dreamed of going to see a witch. Uh, Saul would have said, you know, bless God, kill him, get rid of him. You know, get him out of the land. You know, they and and uh, you know what? He he believed that way back then. But boy, something had changed. Convictions are people describe in different ways, but we're going to call them deep, unshakable decisions. Deep, unshakable. He said in First Corinthians, "Be ye therefore steadfast." unmovable. There ought to be some things in your life that are just unmovable that, you know, it doesn't matter what anybody else does that you're just, you're just not moving. You know, you're, you're not changing. You're not changing. If, if all your preacher friends change, you're not changing. If you get pressure from the relatives, you're not, you're not changing. If, if, you know, it becomes illegal or whatever, um, you know, you're just, you're not going to change if your favorite preacher does it. Look at Second Chronicles 17, convictions. I realize that sometimes people in their youth, you know, they, they can get really radical, you know, and, and I remember being there. Um, I remember when I wouldn't wear blue jeans because I thought they were evil. And I was in Bible school. And, uh, and I wore uh, corduroy pants because they look nice. And, uh, and I wouldn't wear jeans because I sort of thought they were worldly. But you know, uh, you know what Oswald Chambers says? Oswald Chambers says, and we're going to talk about zeal in a minute. Oswald Chambers says, he says, real, true, even that little bit of crazy zeal. He said, that's usually a real mark of genuine salvation. Now he said, he said you know, it's got to be modified a little bit. It takes a little while to, to get it all sorted out. But he said, you find anybody that truly meets the Lord, he said, often that is one of the things that rises to the top because they love the Lord and they're excited and they want to do right and perhaps they're a little extreme. And I remember I would not break the speed limit. Now, maybe you guys forgive me, but I, in, in those days, I, I would not break the speed limit. And, and we had some of the slowest speed limits in the world in that little town where the Bible school was. And it got to be a joke, all the people that rode with me and they said, well, if we ride with Joe, he doesn't break the speed limit. I realize sometimes people can have um, convictions about things that they wear like a badge of righteousness, and yet they neglect other important things. You know, the Lord looked at the Pharisees, and he said, you tithe, you know, mint and rue and cumin, and yet you omit the weightier matters. So, you know, there, there, there's, we know there's extremes, Okay. But, but I, I don't think any of us in this room fall in that category. Do you have any convictions? Like any? I mean, yeah, you know Jesus, the Son of God, and salvation by grace through faith, and you're solid on that. Well, praise the Lord. But, but you got anything that, that is, it is deep in your soul and ain't nobody shaking it?
Look at 2 Chronicles 17, verse 1. And Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his stead and strengthened himself. Now watch. Jehoshaphat, king of the southern kingdom, Judah. He strengthened himself against Israel. And he placed forces in all the fenced cities of Judah and set garrisons in the land of Judah and in the cities of Ephraim, which Asa, his father, had taken. And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the first ways of his father David and sought not unto Balaam, but sought to the Lord God of his father and walked in his commandments and not after the doings of Israel. So here's Jehoshaphat. You know, there was this divide between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was notoriously eyeball deep in idol worship. But the kings of Judah, there were several that were on the ball, still loved the Lord. Jehoshaphat was one of the great kings of Judah. He becomes king and he recognizes his enemy to the north. Now he knows their, you know, their, their, their blood kin, you know, in, in the big picture, but he recognizes that those 10 tribes long ago had abandoned the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and were under the, the sentence of judgment. It hadn't come yet, but it was coming. And Jehoshaphat, right? So Jehoshaphat thought, you know, there's 10 of them tribes. There's two of us. We're not walking together. Uh, and I don't want them infecting us. And uh, he said, we're going to build garrisons. We're going to strengthen ourselves. Uh, we don't want them to take us. He saw them as an enemy. But notice what happens after some years pass in chapter 18. Now, Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance. And, wow, something happens here. He joins affinity with Ahab. That's where the old kings used to do this. They still do this in some of the tribal areas. This king's son, they would match him up with this king's daughter, and they were enemies before. And so they get they get them married. And so the thought is, we can't attack them and they can't attack us because now it's going to kill our kids and our grandkids. That's called joining affinity. Okay? Jeho Jehoshaphat, 18.1, had joined affinity with Ahab. And after certain years, he went down to Ahab to Samaria. And Ahab killed sheep and oxen for him in abundance and for the people that he had with him and persuaded him to go up with him to Ramoth Gilead. Ahab, you guys know, he was, he was one of the terrible, one of the very terrible kings of Israel. You know, there was a day when Jehoshaphat wouldn't have done this to save his life. He wouldn't even look that direction. He had fortified that border. He was not going to have anything to do with Ahab not because he was being snooty and not because he was self-righteous, but he knew that they were enemies of his God. But you know what he did? He, uh, he changed his whole mind on that. And if you know the story, it almost got him killed in, this, in these chapters. It's a good thing to have some deep, unshakable, Decisions. But boy, it's easy to let him go. It's easy for those things to disappear. You're going to have to hold on to them. I mean, if they're rooted in this book and in your walk with God and your perception of who God is and what he wants you to do, you better hold on to that. He gave that to you. It's going to keep you from sin. It's going to keep you from a bad kingdom. It's going to keep you from defilement. It's going to keep you from losing your neck. Jehoshaphat's early decision was the right one. Don't let your, don't let your convictions disappear. Look at Hebrews. Uh, mm. Real quick, Hebrews 3. We're going to do these last two real quick. Hebrews 3. It's interesting, the, the book of Hebrews, it says, God hath in these last days spoken to us by His Son. The book of Hebrews has some very significant end-time thoughts. And um, look at Hebrews 3, verse 12. Take heed, brethren. He's not writing to lost people, he's writing to us. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief, 
in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Boy, can I, can I say uh, it is a wonderful thing to have some sensitivity towards the Lord? It's just a wonderful thing. Um, uh, yeah, you know, I, I guess you, you, can be, you can be oversensitive. You can be, you know, too, too mystical at times. You can be, but most people don't err in that direction. Um, you know, you get saved and everything's new and you love the Lord and uh, man, you're just wide open and uh, you're just, it, it's just, it's all wonderful. And uh, you want to please the Lord. Um, don't lose your sensitivity. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Are you sensitive to the Lord? You know, it's easy to, uh, to be sensitive and then to start ignoring things and overriding your conscience. And the next thing you know, you're just not as sensitive anymore. And things that used to bother you don't bother you. You know, I think, I think it'd be a good thing to get on your knees and just pray it and mean it and say, Dear Lord, I really do want to, I, I want to really be sensitive to you. Um, Lord, if, if, if I've gotten hard anywhere, if I've hardened myself, if I'm not hearing you somewhere because I've hardened my heart, um, Lord, I, I want you to fix that. I, I, I want to go back to where we started, Lord. Because it's easy for that to disappear. Go to 2 Corinthians 9. We'll see the last one here for tonight. 2 Corinthians 9. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 1. It says, For us touching the ministering to the saints... It is superfluous. In other words, it's, it's Paul saying, you guys are already doing this. This really isn't even necessary for me to say, but the Holy Ghost was telling him to say it. It is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. Go to Galatians. Next book to your right. Galatians 4. Your zeal. He's saying there's some people that have got excited about doing the right thing because they've watched you be excited about it. You know, zeal is contagious. You find people that are excited about the Lord and excited about doing right. It is contagious. It is contagious. Galatians 4, verse 18. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I am present with you. Um, the thought there is, Paul saying, it's always good to be zealous. You know what? Most people think of, of zeal as, you know, this, this young guy, this young gal, and they've gotten saved, and they're, they're really on, on fire for the Lord, and, and they, they think it's a phase that a new believer goes through. But Galatians 4 verse 18 says, it is not ever intended to be a phase. It is good to be zealously affected always, always. Look at uh, Acts 19, and you'll see an example of what uh, the zeal did there in, this, in Acts 19. When you think of zeal, you think of something boisterous. You think of something um, just really out there, and, and they're just, um, they're not afraid, and they're happy. They're crazy, and they're happy. That's what you, what you picture zeal. Acts 19, verse 18. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious art, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. You know, these guys, they got saved and... Um, and man, they were just uh, they were just over the top. And they thought, what do we do with this stuff? And they thought, let's all get together and let's just burn it right out in public just for the glory of God. And uh, and they they just they just their zeal had prompted them. You know, they could have thrown it in their wood stove at home. You know, they could have thrown put it out by the curb for the garbage man. But you know what they thought? They thought, no, we don't want to do this. We want to make a statement to the whole world, and um, we we want it, we want to do this publicly, and their zeal made them do that. 
You know, when somebody's zealous, um, they, uh, they can't get enough. They can't get enough. Um, you know, in Revelation 3, the church at Laodicea, that's the lukewarm church. And um, it's, it's not zealous, okay? It's, it's just really comfortable. It's lukewarm. And the Lord says to them, be zealous, therefore. What does he tell the church at Laodicea to do? He says, kick your zeal back in motion. He said, put it in gear and put the hammer down. He said, let's go back to that. He said, let's do it the way you did it when you were excited at the beginning. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. In Romans 12, it says we're to be fervent in spirit. And that's, you know, our inner man, but fervent, you look it up, the word means boiling. You know, just hot. J.C. Ryle said long ago, beware of cooling down. Beware of cooling down. David said, I will run the way of thy commandments. You know, um, um, we have an expression, and every time I say this, I think of Moses, because where are you at, Moses? There you are. You know, we, we always say, we call him, I hear people call him Mosey, okay? But, but down south, when you Mosey, that just means you sort of poke along. Okay. And you know, oh, he's just going to sort of mosey along and do that. You know, um, you know, he says, run, not mosey. I will run the way of thy commands. Um, not, I will think about this sometime soon when I'm not so busy. No, no, no. He said, run the way of thy commandments. He didn't say try a little harder. No, run the way of thy commandments. Ready, set, bang, go. David said, that's my kind of Christianity. He said, I'm going to run the way of thy commandments. You know, that's, that's energy. That's passion. That's go. And it is so important. And it's so natural. And even of Jesus Christ, it was said, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. But you know, it sure can disappear. Galatians 5. Galatians 5. You know, the Lord calls this thing we're doing a race. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Galatians 5 verse 7, Paul writes to the, to the Galatians and he said, ye did run well. But boy, something had disappeared. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? You know, every good thing you have, all these things that we've looked at tonight, they're all uh, parts of the Christian life, and there's, there's things that certainly we could have added along the way. Um, there's things that God has put in your heart. There's, there's abilities that God has given some of you guys. Um, there's knowledge. Some, some of you guys and ladies, some of you have been in this for a long time. And, um, um, you know, um, Paul said, let no man take thy crown. Are these things part of your life? Do you, do you got some convictions? Um, do you got some zeal? Uh, do you love the words of the Lord? Do you have some faith? Uh, are you, uh, are you excited? about what God's doing at your church, all that stuff. Um, thank the Lord for it. Feed that fire. Don't just go on living your life thinking, well, you know, it's good and it'll always be this way. Um, you know, it can always be this way. It can be. And uh, man, we can, we can keep these things till Jesus comes. But if we keep these things till Jesus comes, it will be because we did it on purpose. And we sought the Lord and we fed all these fires and we prayed for God to preserve all these things. It will be because we did it on purpose. Man, the Lord appears and the Lord makes things appear and the Lord lets things disappear. It'd be good every once in a while just to, just to make sure that uh, nothing is shrinking in your Christianity. Let's pray. Oh, I, I used to do this and I used to do that. Did something disappear? 
everybody's different. Everybody's energy level is different. Everybody's opportunities are different. But you know, you, um, you can do what you can. Lord, bless your truth, we pray in Jesus' name. If God has spoken to you tonight, why don't you talk to him? You haven't lost anything, have you? If something's disappeared, you know, he spoke the world into existence. Why don't you call on his name and he'll help you get it going again. Lord, we thank you for the things that we have right now. And Lord, we have, Lord, many good things, great things that you've given us that we still enjoy. Lord, um, should there be anything, Lord, that people are waiting to do, God, would you help them to decide to do it now? Lord, for thee. God, things that need changed, things that need made right, priorities set in order, convictions set in place, lines they need to draw, Lord, help them. God, to decide to do it now. Lord, there's no better day than now. Lord, help us. Time sure has a way of getting away on us, Lord. And uh, suddenly 10 years pass, and Lord, we're, we're at the same place where we once were. Lord, help us. Lord, like the songwriter said, that we would take and hold and gain higher ground, Lord, for Thee. God, may what we know of Thee and of Your presence and of your appearing, may it increase, Lord. May we know more about it, Lord, with time and not less. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.